It is Friday. Welcome to the Sean Spicer Show. We have a great episode coming your way today. We are going to sit down with Vivek Ramaswamy. He is the guy that's getting all of the buzz post-convention, good and bad. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of people the day after that debate, I woke up in Milwaukee. It was everywhere. Online, conservative influencers, Trump supporters. Then I turned on the morning shows. They're all talking about Vivek. The media was going after him. The left couldn't believe some of the answers to his questions. But there was no question about it. He was the guy that everybody was talking about. Um, we're going to ask him all the questions. I want to talk to him about what he thinks post-debate, what he thinks about the attack. What's going to happen to him if he can get this down to a one-on-one -on -one race with Donald Trump? I think that might change the dynamic just a little bit. Suddenly, you're going to get called names. I mean, you remember, I asked Don Jr., about the debate and DeSantis, and he brought up Vivek Ramaswamy. And see, he was very praiseworthy of his response and his performance. Well, what's going to happen when Vivek Ramaswamy is that number two guy, if that comes to be, and everyone else drops out? I don't think Donald Trump's going to have too many nice things to say about it. I'm sorry. I've known the guy long enough. It doesn't matter. He's going to go after him. How is Vivek going to respond? I will ask him that question. Um, what does he think about the story uh, that Newsmax tried to get him to buy ads in return for, for better coverage. That's a, a question that I think is going to be interesting. Why is he going on MSNBC? I wonder that. He's a smart businessman, right? Why would he do that? Um, not because I don't think it's good to take your message everywhere. I do. But why? Why spend a ton of time on an outlet where no Republicans are that's what we want to break down. So much to break down with the guy who everybody's talking about, and we're about to do it. So let's get into it. Do me a favor. Right now, we don't know what day it is, but you guys know how this works. Someday, something's going to happen. We're going to get canceled at some rate, right? So if you're watching it on the 1st, 347, on... DirecTV, who knows? You know we've seen all these stories over the years, DirecTV uh, shutting out one station or not. I, and the first, not, I don't see that ever happening. But you never know. So it's good to have redundancy. Uh, also, um, even if you're just watching online, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe and notification button. Go to Rumble. One or two should be your backup system. But you know how it works. The algorithms, the cancellations, the shadow banning. It's also super helpful to go to Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Why? Even if you just watch it on YouTube or you're watching it on the first, it helps us. And I appreciate that. It's so important for the outside world to see how well independent media is doing and the support that we have. So it's just important. It, it helps folks uh, see that you all want this content. We don't have big corporate folks that can spin and all that kind of stuff. We, we rely on downloads. So um, again, it's helpful to us. It's helpful to you to make sure you got a backup plan. So please do that. Um, and obviously, you know, this conversation that we're going to have with Vivek Ramaswamy, you never know. What, what, is this the day that they decide to cancel us? Who knows? So please take some mo a moment and do that. Um, but speaking of getting going and kicking some butt at debates and whatever, he didn't need this because he's young and he is clearly energetic. But people like me, I need a morning kick. A literal morning kick. And you know who gives it to me? Chuck Norris. That's right. Uh, every morning I start my day off with morning kick. Uh, it is what Chuck Norris has come up with. You know him, right? You've seen him. He's an action star, a veteran, a family guy. But he's more than anything uh, big on his health and big on fitness. That's what I think everybody looks at that guy and says, he could probably kick my butt. He's 83 years old. Um, I've told you this like every day because I look at that and go, I'd like to look like a third of that, a half of that maybe, and I'm in my 50s. Uh, Chuck's tried everything, as you can imagine. When you're a fitness kind of guy, you're trying all these supplements. You want, it's like everyone's telling you to take that pill, take that pill, take a scoop of this. Well, he tried everything and he did it for us. Um, he created Morning Kick, and it's got probiotics that help you lose weight, pro, uh, prebiotics, which is the digestion thing, and then a bunch of superfoods that help you with joints and all that kind of stuff, so you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to mix everything. It's one scoop in the morning, plop it in, a little cold water. I mean, it, you don't have to do cold water. I like the cold water. Um, if you go to mymorningkick.com slash Spicer, 
you can get it for yourself and be like Chuck. MyMorningKick.com slash Spicer. You can start your morning like me. I don't know that you have to do it every morning. I know it's called Morning Kick. I like it in the morning. It's the first thing I do. Uh, so join us. Join me and Chuck. I don't think he knows that, but that's the one thing we have in common. Obviously, um, everyone's going to have their own results, right? But the goal is to have clearer thinking, better digestion, um, and feel better. And that's what it does. And it eliminates having to look around and figure out where you want to, you know, take 18 measuring cups of this and that. It's one thing, boom, done. So try mymorningkick.com uh, and be like Chuck and me, or me and Chuck, anyway. Um, all right. We are about to bring you an amazing discussion with Vivek Ramaswamy. This is the hottest thing right now. This is like politically like a Taylor Swift concert. Okay, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> but I think it is. Um, I actually first met Vivek when he spoke to uh, a dinner at the Independent Women's Forum. And I, I, I interviewed him on my show uh, previously. Uh, I'd read the book, Woke, Inc. And then he's got another one out now. And I'd been like, this guy, I mean, he is one of those folks. It's like a preacher at church. Uh, you're kind of like captivated or a motivational speaker. I love the way that he addressed things in very digestible, easy to understand ways. He understood the consequences of things. He approached things in a way that a lot of conservatives don't do. Um, and he, he captivated a room. I watched sitting at this table, probably like a couple back. Uh, I mean, I literally remember where I was sitting at the table. So yeah, two back, he's up there. And everybody is just staring at him. And you know, you go to a dinner sometimes and everyone's kind of like having side discussions and clinking their glasses and trying to get the waiter or the waitress to come over and fill your glass or give you another piece of bread or whatever it is. Everybody is just captivated at him standing there talking about where we are as a society and all these cultural issues. It's just boom. Um, He's obviously a very successful businessman, an entrepreneur. He's founded all of these different companies, made a ton of money, and he's got a great story, right? His parents come here with nothing. Um, and he builds this very successful business after business, creates a ton of jobs, a bunch of um, patents and businesses that help people. Um, he founded a thing called Strive Asset Management, which is an anti-woke firm. What I mean by that is, you know, sometimes when you're investing, and you're like, gosh, I see that this company can make money, but I don't believe in what they do. Well, Strive basically said, why don't we start investing in companies that you can believe in? Um, it invests in anti-ESG quota focused businesses, right? So all of these BlackRock type companies that are forcing people to make ESG, environmental social governance and DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of their model. Right? When you invest in something, your goal is to say, I hope that makes me money. I hope that makes like a profit because that's why I'm investing in it. And then you find out these companies are throwing money at programs to feel good. That's ridiculous. And he was like, well, guess what? I can make a fund that it focuses on companies that don't have an agenda, that are not there trying to preach about you know, their liberal causes and their ESG and just or have mission focus. If you sell hats, you sell hats. If you sell shoes, they don't have to be conservative. This is what we're supposed to do. I mean, I just, I've never understood this. And he got it and he said, actually, I can make money by creating a fund that you could then invest in. And it's, it's, it's I think it's totally different and it makes, um, it makes sense. It's where we should be investing. I, I've loved this kind of stuff because very few people, a lot of people have talked about it. He went out and did it. Just like he invented all these companies. He's 38 years old. You know, when you interview someone who's like 38 and done this kind of stuff, they're very successful. Um, I literally sometimes think in my head, like, okay, where was I at 38? What was I doing? And how come I sat back and didn't have the energy that he has? Um, he is everywhere though. He's got a ton of energy. He, after founding this firm, he says, I'm running for president. And you see a lot of these folks every cycle do this kind of stuff. And it's funny because he's 38 years old, never run for office. And here he is at the number two polling position, Ron DeSantis and then Ramaswamy at that poll. 
All these other people are whining about not making the stage. Oh, I couldn't make it. Da, 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 da. Okay, he's never run. He wrote some books, obviously, uh, and has been doing the circuit. They, they, it was unbelievable because I'm like, uh, here's a guy who didn't run for office before. He's been doing the rounds. People like his message. Maybe it's you, not you know the the polling requirement, because this guy out of nowhere rockets up the polls. Um, and I think that that's it. They, they, people are excited about his energy. I don't think everyone agrees with every position he takes because, frankly, they don't think they do that with Trump. They just like his energy and his authenticity. Um, and I think you saw that after the debate. I mean, I told him, and I've said this before, but I woke up the next morning and I'm looking because I went to bed very late, right? And we're doing analysis. We were, you saw us in the spin room. And I'm looking at the online stuff and I'm like, holy smokes, everybody's talking about this guy. And I'm not saying that he's going to be the guy. But I'll tell you, he's been getting the attention and he's been working his tail off. He also has been going everywhere. CNN, MSNBC. He went on Andrea Mitchell. He went on Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. He went on with Dana Bash at CNN. And it's funny because he runs circles around these folks. They think they're going to get him. Let me play you a clip from 1941 when the, you know, the grandfather of your whatever said. I mean, they think somehow they're going to get this guy. And they're not. He's really good at what he does. I, I think that the hardest part, though, I, and I, if you, you remember, I've actually said his strategy going into the debate. I've done a ton of interviews. I get called a lot about, you know, why aren't people attacking Trump? And I said, this is stupid. Most of the Republican Party, like 85%, loves Trump or Trump policies. There is a swath of never Trump. And then there is a swath of folks that like Trump policies, but are you know, think he's got some baggage, think he's got some problems, are concerned about the legal, whatever it is. So if you're Chris Christie, you're going after that, what, 10, 15% of never Trumper establishment types, that's never going to win. And I've said this before. The smart move is what Vivek has been doing, which is making the case that I can be Trump without the baggage. Or if this guy falls, I said it the other day, he's drafting. If you're a NASCAR person, you know that, or even, I guess, runner. I'm neither. I'm not a track person or a runner. But I mean, you hear about this all the time, people drafting, and he's drafting. And I think the strategy is if Trump, something were to happen, then he becomes the guy. I think that that's the, if you're going to beat Trump, that's the only way. And I'm not saying it's going to work or it's effective, but I think that's the only strategy that has a shot because this idea of going at Trump, you think that, the majority of voters in caucus and primary states think that's going to work? No, I don't. So I, I think to some degree, you saw even Mike Pence, Trump-Pence administration, Trump-Pence administration policy. They're trying to find that silver lining to be against him. And I don't think it's going to work because you're trying to do two things at once. Christie at least is doing one thing and saying, all I need is X percent. I don't think it's going to work. Vivek at least gets it. He's smart. He's a businessman. He's going after the greatest chunk of voters, which is people who like Trump, like Trump policies, but might be open to somebody who can be sort of 2.0. Going after him is just not going to work. And I, I think, you know, I want to talk to him about that. Why is he, what is his strategy? How is he going to talk to people? Why is he going places that no one else is going to? Um, I think that's a fascinating thing. I get it. I think that's smart for the party. I just don't know that it's smart in a primary. Why? Because no one's watching MSNBC right now that's going to vote in a Republican primary or caucus. Is it good in a general election? Sure. Because you've got independent voters and maybe some people who got lost on the channel and they ended up on CNN or they're sitting in a barber shop or something where CNN's playing or MSNBC's playing. Maybe they end up there. So, okay, I get that. But doing it right now, he's a smart business person. He wouldn't market a product if no one could buy it there. I'm gonna, I want to ask him about that. Why are you going places that there are no customers? So let's think about, I mean, these are all the big questions. I'm going to ask him, tell me what you think. I'm ready to welcome in the guy who was the big dog at the debate in Milwaukee, Vivek Ramaswamy. Vivek, uh, welcome to the show. Congratulations on a huge debate performance. Obviously, woke up the next morning, uh, you saw what I saw, which is everybody buzzing about you and your performance there. Um, talk to me about how it's been since then. 
Well, look, I think that that has provoked a lot of attacks. And, you know, my view is if you can't handle the heat, you stay out of the kitchen. I can handle the heat and I'm in this race to win. But it has been remarkable to watch the establishment wing of the Republican Party rain arrows like a ton of bricks coming and falling from on high, especially on my anti-war positions, particularly on my America first positions when it comes to foreign policy, actually being a realist rather than a standard neocon. But I embrace that. I think that debate is going to make the Republican Party stronger. It's going to make our country stronger. It's going to make me more effective as our next president for having gone through it. But everybody said that when you're uh, rising and you're posing a threat to the others, they're going to come at you. Yeah. Now I know what they meant. But well, uh, to be honest, we're having fun with it because a lot of the arguments are falling flat and falling thin with the people. We're but, but speaking the truth and that's it's, what's going to lead us to succeed. It's not just the attacks. I mean, there's a positive yeah. to this. There's a lot of people yeah. that I'm watching online who are very receptive to what you're saying out there. Um, but But it's interesting because Trump's team his pollster, Tony Fabrizio, put out a new poll. They're, they seem to be playing up Nikki Haley's ascent in Iowa. I know I saw you out there. Obviously, you your message resonated out there very well. Are you concerned at all about not just the national uh, response, but, but the early state response? I'm not, actually. So we're doing better in the national polls than right. in some of the early state polls, in part because there's a really simple reason why. Everybody else's super PACs have been flooding the TV circuits and the airwaves in those early states. We haven't been doing that so far. I have instead been the candidate who has spent the most time on the ground in places like Iowa and New Hampshire. We've done more events in those two early states than anybody else, but they've been intimate, small events, building the activists. So we're going steadily planning to win in January. And, you know, at the right point in time, we'll also do the same thing that conventional politicians do but we haven't been doing it so far. And my view is other people are in a lucky position right. to be, <laughs> lucky position to be super PAC puppets where they say what their super PACs want them to, their super PACs buy them a bunch of TV ads. I'm not a super PAC puppet. I'm a patriot who speaks the truth, but we're gonna have to do this in a grassroots driven manner. Right. And that's the steady approach that we're taking in those early states. So speaking of that steady approach, right? It seems as though, and I actually, it's funny, in interview after interview, I sort of told folks in the media, that your approach is the right one. Uh, draft on Trump, meaning that you are, there's a lot of people who like Trump, Trump policies, but don't necessarily like some of the baggage. And you are presenting yourself, and I don't mean to speak for you, but it seemed to me as though you were presenting yourself as the alternative to Trump, maybe without some of the baggage. The question I have for you, though, if that, if my proposition is correct, and you sort of become the one-on-one -on -one with Trump uh, as the process moves forward, are you concerned at all that Trump Right now, when I spoke to Donald Trump Jr. after the debate, he spoke very well of your performance. But right now, I question how that dynamic changes once it ever became a one-on-one -on -one race. Does Donald Trump then turn his ire and his attacks on you, and does that change the strategy? Well, certainly, I'm not going to be turning ire on him. I, I truly believe he was a great president, right. and I'm grateful for what he did to this country. I just think that I can build on that foundation to go even further. Fact of the matter is, I expect Donald Trump to be my most valued advisor and mentor during my first year as our next president. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I want to actually learn from where he left off, understand where he might have fallen short or wanted to do things better. Great. I want that head start. I believe Donald Trump is a patriot, and I believe that he will serve in that capacity to help me succeed in that role. The fact is, I'm 38, though. I have fresh legs. I'm not yet jaded and cynical and tired. I think it takes somebody whose best days are still yet ahead of himself to see a country whose best days are ahead of itself as a nation too. And that's why I think it, really, I think it has to be me in taking our America first agenda to the next level. I can reunite this country. I'm not yet having an effect on people where 30% of this country is becoming psychiatrically ill <laughs> when I'm in office. Right. That's not Trump's fault, but it's just a fact of what happens in this country. And so I expect him to be somebody who serves as an important mentor and an advisor in that first year in office. I'm going to value that. I've been very clear that I would pardon him. 
I've been very clear that I think, and I stand by it, that he is the best president of the 21st century by far. But are you worried about but the But I attacks? want to build on that foundation and go further. Are you concerned? I mean, but that's great. And I think everybody- So I'm not concerned that he's going to attack. I don't expect him to. Okay, but you, would, be, but you wouldn't go back at him. If he comes after you, it's, you're not going to- I don't think he's going to come after me, actually. Oh, I, I do. think we're both patriots <laughs> who share a vision for the America First agenda. And I think America First, it does not belong to either of right. us. It doesn't belong to Trump and it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the people of this country. And I think if both of us approach it with that spirit, then I think we're gonna have a great result right. for the country no matter who wins. And I'm gonna make the case for why I think it should be me. All right, I'm loving this conversation with Vivek, but I need to talk to you quickly about fourpatriots.com. Obviously, this hurricane that has been going through Florida is we're see, still seeing uh, the impact. People without power, who knows, maybe days, weeks that they're dealing with that. And that's gotta be unbelievably challenging to, to live like that. You're trying to figure out a way to get information. The same thing could happen if our security, if our, if our power grid got attacked. Um, national security experts are, are very, very concerned that it's aging, that it's vulnerable to attack, and that if these uh, key power substations were to get attacked, that it could be days, weeks, months before power could be restored. I mean, you think about it, these folks down in Florida are going for days. Imagine weeks or months it gets darker sooner in these winter months. Uh, we wouldn't be able to power computers, radios. Um, and the cool thing is if you had something like the Patriot power generator, you would have your own solar generator that you could take anywhere. It's portable. You can put it in your house. You can put it driving around with your car. You can bring it outside. But the cool part is you only need the sun and then you'll be able to power everything from your phones, your medical devices, your refrigerator, your TV, your radios, your computer, iPads, tablets, you name it. That's what you're going to have. That's why you got to go to the, get the Patriot Power Generator. And if you go to 4Patriots, the number 4, patriots.com, use the code SPICER, you can get 10% off your first purchase. It's If you spend over 97 bucks, it's shipping is free. You get a year of their famous guarantee. But think about it, whether it's you or a gift, this is something that you want to have in your house. You want to give to a relative to make sure that they have it. It's a great gift to give, uh, just in case you're to get ahead of Christmas or holiday shopping, go to fourpatriots.com. Use code SPICER, get 10% off. That's fourpatriots.com. Go now. Let's get back to that chat with Vivek. Look, you've been making a very good case about going places that a lot of people, a lot of Republicans, a lot of conservatives don't go. Uh, one yep. of the places that it's not just geographical, you go on CNN. Um, and I want to play a quick clip of that exchange you had with Dana Bash this weekend. Uh, where she talks about comments that Congresswoman Presley made about you. Take a listen. To say that she represents and she is a, a modern version of a KKK, which, as you know, was dedicated to the subjugation and violence against black people. How how on earth is she a modern Dana, grand wizard let's be intellectually of that honest. kind of organization? Let let's be intellectually honest and get to the heart of what this debate ought to be about. There is a worldview that says that the remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. That if you're black or brown, you have to have a particular point of view. That's from Ibram Kendi. That's from Ayanna Presley, the people I quoted in my speech yesterday. But can There's you a have an intellectually have, honest says conversation that of who you are, when you accuse you have her to be able of to have being a opinion. grand wizard Let's of have the KKK? Debate. Can you have that intellectually that honest discussion is, with that kind of rhetoric? Yes, I can, Dana, because the point, the point I'm highlighting is that even the people who, in good spirit, we all agree that the KKK was an awful organization that is a toxic stain in our national history. So given that we can start from that point of agreement, now that allows us to say, well, who actually sounds more like that organization today? The people who are calling for more racial discrimination on the basis of skin color. Okay, so here's what I found interesting about that clip. Not your response, I'm gonna leave that to others. What I found interesting is this because you have been a champion of wo of going after woke capitalism, woke policy. The default was what Congresswoman Presley said about you was okay. She attacked you for the color of your skin and not abiding by this idea that you have to have this view of the world based on the color of your skin. That was never a concern to CNN, right? The they, they, their, their, their concern was, here's your response to her basically racist proposition that if you have a certain color skin, which is what Congresswoman Presley attacked you for, you must believe in this. I just, I get a kick out of the fact that these guys have no 
like there was nothing wrong in their view with what Congresswoman Presley said. It was your response that they went after. I, and I stand by my response, that's by the fine, way. That's fine, but don't you think and that you that's know, ridiculous? I, that it's, she, it's, it's, she it's gets a pass? It's laughable but predictable. It's laughable but predictable. The idea, I just want to dissect it for a second, Sean. The idea that the color of your skin should restrict what you say. I can't think of a more racist idea. I think the Grand Wizard of the KKK in the height of their heyday would say, you know what, if you have a certain skin color, you better shut up, sit down, and do as you're told. And that's exactly what the likes of Ibram Kendi and Ayanna Presley say today. Shut up, sit down, and do as you're told. If you're not a black or brown face that has a black or brown voice, we have no use for you. I think it's racist. It's racist in its core. It's the definition of what it means to be toxic and racist. And I'm calling that out for what it is. And I know that made a lot of the left suffer from, I would say, an anaphylactic response and have a mental conniption. But the reality is we need to close the gap between what people say in private and public, start talking openly again. And if I had to guess, the way Dana Bash approached that interview, in her heart of hearts, she probably agrees with me too. But they have to follow the script that's handed from on high in the modern progressive orthodoxy. And I don't adhere to anybody's script, certainly not that one. And so I think that's why we're having a lot of fun in this race. And, you know, they call it the Overton window, Sean, that space of what you're allowed to say in public. <laughs> this campaign is running a truck through that Overton <laughs> window, and I'm having a lot of fun doing it. So speaking of that window in places that you've gone, uh, again, I will give you credit. I think you, as someone who has been preaching this uh, at the Republican Party and others, you are going places. But in a campaign, there are two, the most valuable asset and the most valuable resource is the candidate's time. That's your time. You went on MSNBC the other day and had it out. I, I mean, look, by, by the way, I find it awesome. I think you run circles around Chuck Todd, the folks at CNN, and then Andrea Mitchell. I find it unbelievably entertaining, and I think there's very few people who can do it as effectively as you can. But my question is this. Strategically speaking, you are a smart businessman. Not a smart, you are an unbelievably successful businessman. Is it smart for you to be spending as much time as you are on networks, if you were a businessman and you said, how much money can I make going to visit that customer or that market? Yep. My question is, how much are you gaining going on MSNBC? And you know, just to bring yep. this up, the AP just announced a forum at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Would you go to something like that? And how much do you think that benefits your campaign versus, say, spending more time in Iowa or New Hampshire? So it's a good question. And I think that there's a balance. But my view is there's some unconventional things we're doing in this campaign. Yes. I've even gone geographically to the south side of Chicago or Kensington in the middle of Philadelphia, not exactly early states or GOP voting regions in the middle of a primary. But what I'm hoping to demonstrate in the case I'm making is that the America First agenda means that we stand for all Americans, not Ukrainian government officials, but all Americans here at home. And I think I'm the only candidate in this race who has a last best chance of truly reuniting this country, not by compromising on our principles. See, when I go to those other networks, I don't sort of mollify what I say, like the Chris Christie's and Mike Pence's of the world. No, I don't think that compromise is how we get to national unity. I do it by being uncompromising about our principles, but to also say that even though we disagree, we agree on each other's rights to actually say it. That's why I go to college campuses across this country as well. And so I hope by leading with example, I can look all people, including our primary base in the eye and say that, you know what? If I'm asking you to put me across the table from Xi Jinping, I've proven to you that I'm willing to sit across the table from Chuck Todd or Don Lemon or a 22 year old <laughs> college kid or giving the microphone to a protester at my event in Ottumna, Ottumwa, Iowa. And to show you that I have the fortitude to lead on the global stage by being strong here at home. Yeah. And I think there are other candidates that have a different philosophy. They have said that they won't talk to NBC News because NBC is not nice to them. I view it differently. I have the fortitude. I can handle the heat. And you know what? We end up coming out time and time again, winning on the other side of those exchanges. I'm a big part of the reason why Don Lemon is not on the air, <laughs> That's as the New York Times reported afterwards. And so we show up on the other side's home turf. Is it an even playing field? No, it's not. But we show up and we win. That's what I'm showing our base, and I hope they reward me for it. Yeah, and like I said, I give you credit for it. I just question the 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 risk, the is the juice worth the squeeze? All right, sorry to interrupt that conversation, but I got to tell you quickly about Delta Rescue. As an animal lover, I am so excited about the work that Delta Rescue is doing, uh, caring for animals 
that have been saved from the wilderness. They've been abandoned. Dogs, cats, horses, you name it. These guys do it all. Uh, Delta Rescue provides these abandoned animals a, the largest care-for-life animal shelter in the world. Uh, it's a no-kill shelter. We're talking providing them with food, all sorts of nutrition and veterinary care, um, somewhere to play, all that kind of stuff that that abandoned and not cared for animals need. It's a no-kill shelter, which is awesome as somebody who's rescued three dogs, uh, making sure that these animals are all peaceful and happy as they go get to live on their life. If you can go to deltarescue.org and help out, no contribution is too small. This is what they rely on. If you're an animal lover, these are the kind of people who are doing the work that we all care about. Uh, deltarescue.org, no contribution, five bucks, 10, 100, whatever it is, this is what's going to make sure that these animals uh, are taken care of properly, that they can live out their lives, don't have to worry about being euthanized in any way. This is the kind of place that all of us would want to make sure that our animal was at if they ever got abandoned or if we knew if someone had, I mean, this is this is the perfect place. Um, they'll make sure that if you contribute that you get their monthly newsletter, you hear about all these stories. So please go to deltarescue.org and, uh, and help support the great work they're doing. Now back to our conversation. One place that I thought was interesting that you did show up, and this is years ago, a clip has resurfaced of you uh, in the audience at Hardball questioning Al Sharpton. When you questioned Al Sharpton, though, you said, and this is back when Kerry and Edwards and others were running, yep. they, they had, you had talked about them being in this audience and showing up. And then you questioned Sharpton and you said, why should I vote for you if you're the least experienced? Reverend Sharpton, hello, I'm Vivek. And I want to ask you, uh, last week on the show, we had Senator Kerry and this week and, and, and the week before we had Senator Edwards. And my question for you is, of all the Democratic candidates out there, why should I vote for the one with the least political experience? Well, you shouldn't, because I have the most political experience. <laughs> so the, here's the question. It's a fair question now for you among the same, it, it's almost the same dynamic. You got these senators and former governors, et cetera. Yeah. So how would you answer the same question that younger Vivek asked? So one of the things that I've learned is that those with the so-called experience in this country are the ones who have actually ruined this country. Look at the people with experience who led us into Iraq and invasion on a flawed theory of weapons of mass destruction. Those who led us into the 2008 financial crisis and the toxic bailouts that came afterwards. Both of those, by the way, are experienced Republicans. You see the same thing on the other side, the experienced intelligence officials who claim that the Trump-Russia collusion hoax was really the collusion and the, and, and the partnership with Russia was really a credible theory. Those same intelligence experts are also the ones that have experience enough to say the Hunter Biden laptop story was Russian disinformation. So you see that time and again, the experts who wrote a letter to the Lancet saying that the pandemic did not originate in a lab in China when we now know today <laughs> that it does. Repeatedly, what have we learned? The so-called experts, those with experience, they're the ones that have been repeatedly crashing the car of this country time and again. And if somebody repeatedly crashes your car every time over and over again, try handing over the keys to somebody new instead. That's what I've learned actually over the years is that the so-called experience is really a formula for corruption. It's a formula for entitlement. And you know what? I do just think at this moment in our history, it will take someone coming in from the outside to get this ship right. And part of the reason I understand this is as a young person, I'm a millennial. Right. I'm part of a generation that the government has repeatedly lied to on issue after issue, time and again. Even the idea of the American dream, the idea that you get a four-year college education with debt. You know what? It worked out okay for me, but many of my peers are still paying off their college debts. It's been one lie after another. And I understand why young people are now jaded and cynical. Sean, I really do. I get it. Right. I know how to reach them, but I think it is going to take that outsider both in substance and in spirit to get that done. And I think I'm the true outsider in this race, and that's uh, why I'm in it. No question about it, and that's why I think you had the reaction you did. Um, yeah. One last question, because I know your time is tight. Yeah. There was, um, in the last couple of days, Newsmax has put out several texts and Instagram posts talking about the polling, uh, and, and neither here nor there, but it seems to be going after you, talking about, uh, and, I, and I just how you fared after the debate. But there was a story that had come out in, the, in, in an outlet called Semaphore a couple of weeks ago saying that they, they had tried to pressure you into buying more ads can you just clarify, is that true? And do you think that that's why their, their, their posts and such target you in a way that might not be fairly? 
Well, I have seen a difference in coverage since that story came out from Semaphore. So that's just a fact. And I think you and others have, have apparently noticed it too. I didn't provide that information to Semaphore, but Semaphore did report that Newsmax said that, you know what, one of the ways we could get more coverage was through advertising. And so, look, I want to be respectful to colleagues across the political spectrum. People can look at the facts and form their own judgments about which candidates have been or had purchased ads and have been you know, treated in a certain way on that network, even some candidates who weren't on that debate stage. But you know, I'm not in this race to disparage or, or to you know, embarrass anybody else. I'm in this race to speak the truth about what I stand for and where we're headed. All I will say is it has been very educational for me to see how corrupt the existing political media establishment is. And that's not limited to right wing or left wing. It's just a broken system, the super PAC puppetry of the way partisan politics is run. It's been an eye opening experience for me, but all the more reason why it's given me my sense of conviction that it takes a true outsider willing to speak the truth to get that job done. And on the particular question that you're asking about, I think it wouldn't take uh, Sherlock Holmes to do their homework and figure out for themselves both before and after exactly how things go down in media. All right. Well, listen, I know you're busy. You've yeah. hugely, huge, big response after that first debate. Look forward to seeing you out in Simi Valley at the next debate. Congratulations on your success since the debate. Be safe on the campaign trail and we'll see you back. Thank you. I appreciate it. You bet. All right. I love that conversation. You know why? When you hear folks that are in politics for a while, they always have a canned answer. I would do this. Our country is better off. You know, I'm focused on the next generation, not this election. There's always something, and I get it. I've been involved in this for 30 years. Sometimes I actually wrote those things. Um, but he's authentic and real. It's kind of what Trump was. You know, it's interesting. I always get asked with Donald Trump, did you ever tell him not to do this? And I'm like, yeah, like five times. And then Trump would look at me and say, we did it your way, or I did it my way, and, and I went up in the polls, or I did this. And he was always right. I'm not saying I, I disagree with my assessment, because I think for most politicians, they can't pull it off. But it's interesting because he had his own style, and it worked. And I think Vivek has that as well. Um, he's not out there with all the backlash from some of his answers in the debate, and I don't agree with every one of them. He's not backing away. He's like, what I meant to say was, or it's being taken out of context. He's like, look, this is what I said and why. Right? He's owning it. And I think that's refreshing because one of the things that I think people appreciated about Trump was that he owned it. He wasn't trying to, to sell you all the time on like, you know, that's not really, it was sort of, hey, this is who I am. This is what we need to do. We need to build a wall. And this is why, you know, this is why that reporter, they, he wasn't sucking up to reporters and donors. And I think that there's something refreshing with people where you're like, I don't agree with that. I asked, I don't know if you remember, but I asked Jeff Kaufman. He was the chairman of Iowa when we were out there at the state fair. I put this up, this before the show launched, but I put it up. And you can go back and look at it on, on, on the YouTube if you're there or Rumble. And I asked Jeff Kaufman, I said, if you come to Iowa and you don't, like, how, how's the, how would it be best to approach an issue, like, if you didn't support something that was, like, maybe, like, you were a vegan or something? He said, remember, when Ted Cruz came to Iowa, he wasn't an ethanol supporter. He was just honest with us and said, I don't agree with this. Here's why and da 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 But here are my policies to move the economy forward. And he won. And Jeff Kaufman's point was they appreciated the honesty more than anything. And I think that that's to some degree what Vivek is banking on. I'm going to be straight with you. This is what I think. Uh, and, you know, and I think there's so, and, and then that, and there's, there's a combination, as I said at the, the beginning of this. I think part of this is also that his, he is trying to sell this as, hey, you like Trump. I'm supporting Trump. I support the policies, but for a variety of reasons, Trump has all these negatives and can't bring the country together and unite it. And he doesn't blame them. You heard him say that. But I think what he's saying is, hey, look, I'm new, I'm fresh, I'm young. I'm a person of color, so I can have conversations that a lot of other folks don't. I'm going to these other places that other people aren't going. 
And so I can try to unite people. For a lot of people, I think that might work. It's going to be interesting. I didn't really get into this with him, but, you know, he mentioned what's going on in Iowa in these early states, and that's going to be important. The national polls don't matter because if you can't win Iowa or New Hampshire or whatever, it's not going to matter. And Iowa is an organizing state. It takes about 50,000 votes. We're talking about 100 to 170 to 180, 85,000 voters. You got a lot of people at least in right now. So if you're him, you do need to do really well. I mean, he, if he can pull off third in Iowa, that's going to be big. Keep going forward. So this is going to be fascinating. I've said this before. There's a phrase, mechanics matter. What do I mean by that? What I mean is you can't just have a great message and do TV. You need to be out there doing voter contact, knocking on doors, having a mail program, having an, what they call an AB chase program, an absentee ballot chase program, so that people who might not be able to vote on election day, you know who they are, you get them to get that ballot, you get them to return it. Having somebody who supports you is great, but it doesn't matter if they don't vote for you, right? This is like having somebody that likes your product. I've always said that politics is just an extension of marketing. Instead of having someone buy your product, you're having someone vote for you, donate to you, activate, volunteer, do an action. So if you have a great product, but no one buys it, then it doesn't matter. You'll go out of business. If you are a great candidate with a great message, but no one's out there mixing it up with the voters, getting them to support you and vote for you and activate for you, volunteer for you, donate to you, then it doesn't matter. You know, I also thought it was interesting that Vivek talked about this story that's out there in Semaphore about ads in Newsmax. He didn't dodge the question. He could have. He didn't. I thought it was fascinating because this is why we need independent media. There's no quid pro quo. No one's going to buy ads on this show. This isn't what we do. You, heard, you know who we are. We've got great sponsors. But these other guys, this is what they, they need to survive. Political season, man, it's like, it's like a drug for them. They got to get it. They gotta, this is their high. They got to get all this political ad spending from the super PACs and the campaigns you know, in season. This is a big deal for them. So I thought that was a fascinating interest that he was willing to, to address that head on. We'll see where this goes from there. We'll be keeping an eye on it. But this is a reminder of why independent media is so important. Think about the people and the voices that are shaping this election. You know, when Fox partnered for that debate, they had rumble. Yeah, there's a reason. Because it's becoming an equal part of the ecosystem. You don't need NBC and CNN and all those folks anymore. You've got the first. You've got the Daily Wire. You've got the Blaze. Uh, all of these other places, these huge voices out there. Dana Lash, Liz Wheeler, Bill O'Reilly, Dan Bongino, Jesse Kelly, Mike Slater. I mean, th there's enough people now that have the tools to, to influence this a lot more than you did before. It's not just Fox anymore. There's a lot more people in the ecosystem. So I'm glad to hear how he's addressing this. It was awesome to see him not back out. And I do appreciate his time, by the way. He's got so many opportunities. You've seen him all over the place. And he sat down with us. It was, I got to talk to him in Iowa when we were out there. But this is what we're able to bring you. Through my connections and my experience and my time, I can bring the key players to you every single day. And that's what we're going to do. So I appreciate your support. I hope you have a great weekend. And during this weekend, uh, if you're not watching this on Friday, please share it with folks on Saturday and Sunday, and even Monday, because a lot of folks have the day off on Monday. But please continue to do that. And I hope you do get some downtime. And while you have that downtime, my goodness, what are you going to do with it? Don't put, on, put off cleaning the house or doing the yard work. Take five minutes and subscribe. Go to... Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Do it. Make sure that your, your spouse and your friends and your coworkers do it too. This is it. You got to, you know, get some time this weekend. Take some time to subscribe to everything. Go to YouTube, hit that subscribe and notification button. Same thing on Rumble. Anyway, I appreciate you being with us. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. A lot more to come. Have a great weekend. We'll see you back here next week on The Sean Spicer Show. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.